there's a belief out there that multi-cookers like this Instant Pot offer a magical solution. Take a load of ingredients, dump them in, and sometime 10 to 60 minutes later, you're gonna have an amazing meal. In my experience, it's not always as simple as that. I'm Joe. I'm a test cook in America's Test Kitchen. Over the last seven years, I've worked on over 20 cookbooks. When they asked me to work on a whole load of multi-cooker recipes, I wasn't that jazzed about it. Why would I want to work with this when I could work with this? Cooking is supposed to be a sensory, mindful experience where you can smell, taste, stir, and hear the food cooking. This is literally a black box, a black cylinder, black cylindoid. We're gonna look at, in depth, one of the mainstays of classical cooking, the braise, and why the Instant Pot is so suited to this type of cooking. And I'm gonna make for you one of my all-time favorite multi-cooker recipes, braised short ribs with fennel and pickled grapes. Over the years, and the three cookbooks we worked on multi-cookers, we really saw the improvement and the potential for what these devices are capable of. The first thing we did was take a really good look inside of one. A pot, unsurprisingly, with a heavy duty core with an aluminum center. And this gives you much better browning than the old models. In fact, the old ones were just simply stainless steel affairs with a very thin gauge, much more uneven browning. And inside the Instant Pot, there's a big heating element with a thermostat, which allows the Instant Pot to regulate the temperature. And we've got a really tight fitting lid here. So you've got a silicon gasket that ensures a very tight seal with a heavy duty locking mechanism. So broadly speaking, the way that the pressure function works is it heats the food and the moisture inside that food will evaporate, turn to steam. And as that steam has got nowhere to go, it accumulates and pressure builds to a point at which water won't boil at 212 degrees, it boils at 250 degrees, which means that food cooks much more quickly in there. And that's what makes it so particularly suited to cooking tough cuts of meat. When braising, there are certain steps you need to take. Whiteboard, please. Step one, sear or not. Most recipes will start with a browning step. You get so much flavor from that browning, from the Maillard reaction. Step two, cook your first set of aromatics. This is your onions, your carrots, your celery, your fennel, and this will soften them and sweeten them and give you a savory base to your braise. Step three, cook your second set of aromatics. These are your quick cooking aromatics. These are your garlic, your spices, your herbs. And it normally takes about 30 seconds. Step four, deglaze. This is adding liquid to dislodge the brown particles on the base of your pot. This is going to give all that extra flavor. It's also called fond, and it's very important, particularly with the Instant Pot, so you don't get any burn messages. Step five, add your liquid. A braise is always cooked in some sort of liquid in order to convert the tough collagen in your meat into tender gelatin. Six, cook. A braise is always cooked in an enclosed environment. Now this could be a pot on the stove, in the oven, or a multi-cooker. Step seven, finish. This is where you make the final adjustments to the sauce. You might want to thicken it a little bit or season it with some vinegar, some fresh herbs, and it's just what makes the entire dish sing. Today, we're gonna to be doing a braise in the multi-cooker using the Cadillac cut of the cow, the short rib. Now, it is so perfectly suited to braises. It's got really lovely intramuscular fat and plenty of collagen. That's the connective tissue that in the Instant Pot is gonna to turn to delicious gelatin and it'll be super soft and tender with a really meaty flavor. We're gonna to wanna to cut them into one and a half to two inch thick strips and then we're gonna cut them crosswise into one and a half to two inch pieces. So I've got one and a half pounds total of boneless beef short ribs. I've got a tablespoon of extra virgin olive oil in the Instant Pot, and we're gonna heat it using the saute function, and then start, and we're just gonna preheat this. It'll take two to three minutes to get really hot. We're looking for the oil to be just smoking, which will give us a really good sear. Now we're using beef today, but there are plenty of cuts that work really well when you're using a multi-cooker, or indeed any pressure cooker. You wanna look for things that are generally a little bit tough, that will really tenderize with long amounts of cooking. So on the, on the cow, you can look for things like chuck or bone-in short ribs. Lamb or pork shoulder works really well too. And if you're cooking chicken in the Instant Pot, you really want to be looking at dark meat, things like thighs and drumsticks. They turn really tender and they can withstand some sort of temperature variation as well. So the oil's almost ready. We're gonna pat our beef dry. And so I always like to pat my meat dry 
and season it right before cooking because when you add salt, it can draw out some of that moisture and that moisture really can impair that browning. I'm just gonna add a half teaspoon of table salt and toss the combined so it's all well coated. I'm gonna cook this until it's very well browned. It'll take about six to eight minutes. We wanna brown it on all sides. For me, one of the biggest improvements of Instant Pot over the years, the quality of the browning. When I first started developing recipes with Instant Pot, the browning was not nearly as good. You used to have a lot of these hot spots when you just had that single ply, tight gauge, stainless steel material. But now you just get this beautiful uniform browning. Because of their clad bottoms, they really have very even temperature throughout the entire surface. And that's something that, to me, is really important. Our short ribs are nice and brown, but also there's a load of fond in the pot. At the same time, the meats render that fat. We're gonna use that for our next step, the cooking of the first round of aromatics. For our main aromatics, I've got one onion here that I've sliced a half inch thick, and we've got a whole head of fennel. I'm just gonna cut the fronds off here. We're gonna use these later, so I'm just gonna keep them here in a bowl till we need them. And we're gonna cut these into one inch thick wedges. Now that's a lot thicker and a lot bigger than you'd normally do when you're sweating your aromatics. But the reason for that, we're cooking the meat for 35 minutes in order to get it tender. So I'm cutting them to a bigger size so that they're more likely to hold together with that long cooking time. Got some garlic, some chicken broth, two teaspoons of fennel seed, some salt, and a rosemary sprig. We're we'll throwing our onions, hear that good sizzle, our fennel wedges, and we're gonna add a quarter teaspoon of salt here as well. One of my favorite tools for Instant Pot is a flat-bottomed wooden spoon. Now this flat bottom really enables you to dislodge any of that fond. And we're gonna cook these until the veggies are lightly browned, which will take about five minutes. We don't wanna overcook them because they get a lot of cooking later. Four cloves of minced garlic, I'm gonna add that. I've got two teaspoons of fennel seeds here as well, which is a pretty hefty amount. We're gonna add that to our fresh fennel. So we're really gonna get multi-dimensional fennel flavor here. We're gonna cook this for about 30 seconds, just so that their flavors can really bloom in the oil. So the pot's really hot now, and we want to add our liquid. I've got a half cup of broth here. Oh, lovely. Oh, you can really smell the garlic now as the broth evaporates and dislodges all of those lovely, delicious brown bits. And that was a half cup of broth, which isn't very much, but through our testing, we discovered that was the minimum amount we needed to ensure that the Instant Pot doesn't run out of liquid. Because one of the worst things that can happen during testing, this happened a lot, is the dreaded burn notice. Now, it's so frustrating when it happens, and it really happens for three reasons. One, you're not using enough liquid. Two, if your sauce is too thick. So if you're using something like a tomato sauce, it's just too viscous. And the other reason is if you don't deglaze. All those delicious brown bits of food that are stuck onto the base of the pan, we really want to incorporate that into the sauce so that we can taste it later. I'm gonna kill the heat now. And we're gonna add a sprig of rosemary for some real lovely fresh aromatic flavor. We're gonna add our meat, as well as all the juices that they've given off, because there's so much flavor in that. I'm gonna set the cover in place. Let it sing to you. Give it a little twist, and we're gonna cook this for 35 minutes. Now, the Instant Pot hasn't started counting down yet, and you can see that because it just says on, it doesn't have a timer. And that's because the 35 minutes refers to 35 minutes of cooking under pressure, and it's still coming up to pressure now. So if you have a look, there's this little red pressure gauge. When that pops up, that tells you that the inside of the pot is pressurized. It's wobbling, it's shaking, it's rolling, and there we go. We know it's 35 minutes till the food is ready. And so now we're gonna prep the ingredients for our final step, the finish. In almost any long cooked dish, whether it's a stew, a braise or a soup, one of the final things you'll add is some acidity. And you can do that with vinegar, you can do that with lemon juice. But today we're gonna to take that one step further. We're gonna make a quick pickle. So I've got here a quarter cup of red wine vinegar. I'm gonna to add to that a tablespoon of sugar and a quarter teaspoon of table salt. And we just want to combine that so it's dissolved somewhat. And then we're gonna bring this to a simmer in the microwave. This will just take one minute. So we're just at a bare simmer now. And we're gonna add four ounces of seedless red grapes that I've halved. And we're just gonna marinate these for about 20 minutes. While these marinate, I'm gonna prep our fennel. So these were our fronds from earlier. 
And you just want to pull away the more sort of tender tips and they just give that extra freshness. It just wakes the whole thing up. That's our finishing items done. I'll see you in uh, 18 minutes. Before we can open it up, we need to release its pressure. And there are two ways to do that. There's the quick release and the natural release. During testing, we found that the quick release method was actually pretty terrifying at first. You just get this eruption of steam and a fear that the whole thing is going to blow up. But it's useful for vegetables and proteins where you want to stop the cooking quickly, like chicken breasts or fish. The problem with that, though, is it's about 245 degrees Fahrenheit in there at the moment. As soon as that happens, all that moisture would turn to steam. And that would be a problem. That would dry out the meat and it can turn it chewy. We don't want that. So for these long cooked cuts of meat, we want to turn to a natural release. So for that, you just simply need to leave it until the temperature inside drops sufficiently that it becomes depressurized. But we've actually found a quicker way of getting that natural release. It's using the ice method. There's a little hatch on the top of the multi-cooker. You take this off and then this metal surface is super hot. It's the same temperature as the food on the inside. You wouldn't want to touch that. But if you slide in, a bag of ice. And this cuts the natural release time from about 15 to 20 minutes to about five or six minutes. So it's been about five minutes and we can tell that it's depressurized because the pressure gauge has dropped. Remove our bag of ice and we can open up our pressure cooker safely. And it's barely even simmering now. Oh, but it smells really good. So I'm gonna remove the beef. Oh, I can feel it's tender as well. And I'm gonna remove the rosemary that's really given us everything it's got to give and now we can separate the veggies from the sauce so i'm just going to strain it into a small bowl yeah we still get those nice big wedges of fennel and i'm just going to put this into a fat separator because one of the things that short ribs have is a lot of fat and that's one of the things that really makes them a great cut for braising but if you leave that fat in the sauce you're gonna have a greasy sauce so there are a few ways in which you can get rid of it you could either skim it off using a spoon, you could chill it and remove it once it's hardened, or the, probably the quickest and easiest way is using a fat separator. So I'm just gonna let this settle for a few minutes and that's gonna be a delicious finishing sauce. So now I can use the fat separator to keep the lean, flavorful broth away from the fat. Now we're ready to plate up. So first of all, we're gonna put down our nice big thick fennel wedges. Here we go, oh, this smells so good. It's like an onion fennel jam, but with a little bit of texture to it. We can put our pieces of beef on top, add a little bit of sauce on top of that. Everything is going to taste very deep, very savoury, very tender, but we want to add those bright notes. And this is where the pickled grapes come in. So I strain these to get rid of the excess vinegar. They're just going to give that nice acidic counter to the rich braised meat flavour. And then I'm going to finish with our fennel fronds, which again, just add those little pops of freshness. This is looking absolutely stunning. I am so excited to eat this. Oh, it just shreds apart. That's lovely. Mmm. 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 Oh, that is so good. It's really tender. It's intensely meaty. You get all those different flavors of the fennel, the sweetness from the cooked fennel, the freshness from the fronds. The fennel seeds just add depth of flavor to the overall dish. Part of why this is such a successful recipe is because we did all the steps as we've described earlier. Now, when we tested just simply taking all the ingredients, dumping them in and cooking them for the same amount of time, we had radically different results. For a start, the broth was much less concentrated. It was much paler. It just didn't have as much body because all that gelatin from the beef has gone into the sauce. Secondly, the meat wasn't brown. So again, there was much less flavor. And then when we quick released it, we found it was just chewy and you get a much better result if you do this natural release, whether you use the ice method or simply the natural wait 15 to 20 minutes method. So remember, our steps for this braise are important and they can be applied to pretty much any other instant pot braise. If you have a multi-cooker at home, I implore you, please make this dish. It is so impressive. It's restaurant quality food in about an hour and a quarter, maybe an hour and a half, and it tastes like it's been cooked for hours. I'm gonna have one more bite. What are some other multi-cooker recipes and techniques you would like to learn about? Let me know in the comments below. Drop a like and check out americastestkitchen.com for more recipes like this one.